On Sunday, June 8, 2014, the Bethel Historical Society of Bethel, Maine held a dedication and official opening for the new wing of the Society's Robinson House. The new wing, named the Mary E. Valentine Collections Wing, will allow the Society to organize and properly store its growing collection of historical artifacts. The event was held outdoors under a tent on the lawn next to the Robinson House. Well, folks. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to have to speak up as I don't have a microphone. And uh, I, first of all, want to uh, welcome you all. My name is Nancy Stoll White, and I'm president of the Board of Trustees of the Bethel Historical Society. And on the behalf of the board, I want to say. Um, First of all, welcome, welcome. We're so delighted to see you all here. Uh, I also want to say thank you for coming out on this warm Sunday afternoon. I know uh, this early in the summer season, many of us think of gardens and, uh, and getting outside and, and uh, working around as we have not had much opportunity to do that in the last five or six months. <laughs> so. This is a uh, great occasion and really unique in the history of the Bethel Historical Society. We have... <laughs> we have purchased space, we have renovated existing space, but we haven't built from scratch, from the ground up, a uh, new space in the Society's nearly 50-year history. So. I just, part of me just wants to say, wow, <laughs> this, is, this is really wonderful. And, uh, and a, a moment on why this is also just so important to the society. I, in significant ways, this building is allowing us to better fulfill our mission to not only collect, but to preserve with temperature controlled space uh, our, our collections. Um, most of all, this space is going to make our collections more accessible, uh, particularly the objects and artifacts that will be stored in this, in this new Valentine wing. Uh, with this wing, we now have the space, the rooms, the shelving, uh, to really find a home for our objects and artifacts uh, in such a way that every place We'll have, well, this is me in, in ideal land. Every place will have a label and we'll know exactly where to find that object. So that's what we're shooting for. We're getting closer with this, with this edition. Right, right. Um, and the reason that's important is that, it, that makes it easier for Randy, for a visiting scholar, for students, for, for all of you who want to come in and, and study our collection. Uh, it makes it more accessible for us to find those objects for you or for our scholars and, and students, uh, for exhibits or for research. This sounds um, pretty basic and not very sexy, but for anyone who's lived in a house for more than five years knows Staying organized isn't easy, and particularly when you've lived there for nearly 50 years, the house has grown, the occupants have changed multiple times, and by def definition, you're living with a bunch of collectors. And <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big deal, and, and we're excited about that. So before we move on to learning a little more about the remarkable woman who made this building possible, to ribbon cutting and tours and refreshments, I want to say thank you to Mary E. Valentine, who I hope is looking in on us today, and whose generous legacy has made the construction of this wing and our ability to properly really organize our stuff possible. I want to thank also uh, the fam family of Jane Champagne and the Goddard Folsom Fund, who have been particularly patient and generous in their support of preserving collections and making them accessible. I want to thank the many donors uh, whose financial support has contributed to this project. I'm not going to go through um, all the names, but there is a list inside, and I hope you take a moment to, to read through it. 
we are fortunate to live in a generous community and I see many of you who have contributed to this project right here and I personally thank you for, for your support. A heartfelt thanks also to those who've supported the project through their hard and I should say uh, careful and considerate work, uh, particularly our uh, master builder Dan Gibbs and his helper uh, Jeremy Gibbs in construction, excavators Doug and Denny Wilson and D.A. Wilson Corp, painter Vern Davis and his crew. I'm, I'm proud to point out that these are all local tradespeople and their work speaks to the talent of craftsmen and tradespeople found right here in Bethel. We are fortunate. We're fortunate. <laughs> Finally, thanks to Administrative Assistant Dana Nickerson, who has put her heart and soul so much into this place that she's absent due to, can I say it? She's got pneumonia. So she is not with us today, um, although her, her fingerprints are all over lots of the details of what you'll see when you go inside. Fellow trustees Jackie Bell, Donna Gillis, and Rosemary Laban have also been very, very helpful in organizing this dedication celebration. And I can't um, stop without saying a special huge thanks to our chief co coordinator of all parts, moving and otherwise, and that would be Executive Director Randy Bennett. Thank you for all your hard work, Randy, in making this possible. I'm going to turn the podium over to our board vice president, Tinika Owinga, who has worked tire tirelessly to bring this project to fruition and who has also been a bit of a conduit for Mary Valentine. So she is going to speak a little bit about Mary. Thank you. Wonderful to see all of you here. Wonderful. As Mary's friend and personal representative, I can assure you that Mary Valentine, in her own quiet way, would have been thrilled to see this new space, which will finally give us access, finally, access to the Bethel Historical Society's valuable and interesting collections. Believe me, Mary loved collecting. <laughs> <laughs> she might have inherited that hobby from her parents, Carol and Nell Valentine, who, whenever possible, went to auctions to add to their family treasures. Some of you will remember when the Valentine House on Mechanic Street went up in flames on Valentine's Day in 1983 and many friends and neighbors rescued most of the contents of the house. Well, I can tell you, Mary guarded them for the rest of her life. <laughs> for, F, for her, every item was special because it represented history of family and local happenings. She had a great respect for the preservation of the past. Mary was born in 1925 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where her father worked at Westinghouse. She received her master's in education and a degree in music from Indiana University, and this was followed by a master's degree in library science from Columbia. For 15 years, Mary enjoyed her jobs as assistant library director in Braintree and later on when she oversaw seven school libraries in Whitman, Mass. During their childhood, Mary and her brother Richard, who could not be here today, and even later on beyond their childhood whenever possible, Mary and Richard spent part of their summers in Bethel at the farm of their Valentine grandparents and part of it on the coast in Seal Harbor, where their mother, Nell Whitmore, grew up. Mary's parents moved back to Bethel after Carol retired, and in 1973, they asked Mary to come so that she could take care of them. In our Bethel community, we really profited from all of Mary's interest. Besides being a collector, Mary was a meticulous researcher. Her genealogical research of her ancestors, going back to John Alden, was very precise. 
On her mother's side, she researched all the branches of the Whitmore family from Seal Harbor. Did you know that Mary was related to the Jordan family of the famous Jordan Pond House? It was no wonder that she and Richard, whenever possible, would go over there for their famous popovers. <laughs> but her research was not confined to her family. Mary helped others with their genealogical questions, detailed the history of local monuments, and indexed several works. During her last decade, Mary was truly fascinated by her research on the Mormons, whose charismatic leaders visited this area and who persuaded local families to move out west. Mary wrote several articles about her findings. When later on Mormons visited Bethel, she was delighted to show them the local places connected with the families who left for Utah. It was a topic which truly interested her till the end of her life. Mary was an avid reader and happily volunteered at the Bethel Library. She would prefer to stick her nose in the book rather than attending to mundane chores. She left over 10,000 books Remember, Steve? No, no. <laughs> she left over 10,000 books covering a multitude of topics. I bet you will still find some at the annual library sale on <laughs> Moliocket weekend. Many, many of us know she was also a gifted organist trained by the best music teachers in Bloomington, Indiana. Who can forget the beautiful organ music in the Congregational Church where she played and directed the choir for 25 years? The Catholic and Methodist churches also profited from her musical talent. Mary made several trips to Europe to follow the footsteps of her favorite classical composers, Bach, Beethoven, Handel, and Sibelius. And this might surprise you, she also owned music by Janis Joplin and several <laughs> other jazz musicians. That little house was rocking down the street. <laughs> In her time off, Mary enjoyed hiking in Maine and New Hampshire with her longtime friend from Bloomington, Indiana days, Laura Jane. Now, Mary was tall, Laura Jane was short, and she would often complain how hard it was to keep up with Mary's long strides, but she managed. But above all, the Historical Society was Mary's home. Besides the research, Mary liked being a guide at the Moses Mason House Museum, wearing her old-fashioned blue dress in which she was buried. She also loved swapping stories, information, and laughter with Dana and Randy over a cup of tea. Mary was a very private woman, but her heart, her joy, was volunteering for the society which shared her interest that her bequest would translate into this beautiful practical edition, which besides showing collections also has space for the preparation of exhibits, is a very fitting tribute to this intelligent and talented woman whom we now celebrate. Thank you. And I'll now turn the lecture over to our executive director, Randy Bennett, for further remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tenneka. That was fantastic. As, as all of you know, uh, I've been here forever, and I'm known for being long-winded. Uh, <laughs> however, thanks to this project, I'm really tired. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this very short. Uh, I do. I do want to start out uh, just by uh, repeating what Nancy has said. A big thank you to everyone involved in this project: to Dan and Jeremy Gibbs, to Doug Wilson, uh, the D.A. Wilson Company, to Vern Davis and his crew. Uh, of course, to all of you who have donated to the Valentine Fund. There are some that are not here yet. Uh, I would especially like to thank Tinica Owinga who, as the late Mary Valentine's representative, saw to it that Mary's wishes were carried out to the society's tremendous benefit. And we owe a debt of gratitude to Tinica for doing that. And <laughs> again, to, to Dana Nickerson, to, uh, to all of the volunteers who have made today's event possible, uh, I uh, extend my heartfelt thanks. 
Um, a brief quote from our collections management policy states, all objects added to the collection are accepted with the full knowledge that the society must care for and maintain suitable storage for them. Uh, as we've known for many years, we've made good progress in lots of areas. Collection storage hasn't been one of them until now. And thanks to Mary's bequest and to your generous donations, even though you'll see many empty shelves, I've hidden away the objects until we're ready to start moving a lot of them, uh, we are finally going to have a place to put them. And not only to put them, but to access them. Uh, many times people have come up to me and have said, well, we've donated such and such, and we haven't seen it on display. When the collection amounts to 38,000 items, there, there are no buildings large enough to display everything, and you really shouldn't display everything. Uh, we try to do themed exhibits, but now we'll be able to rotate those exhibits at a faster pace. We'll also be able to make the collections available as a study collection. So if someone calls up and says, I'd like to see every pair of 19th century shoes that you own, we hopefully can say, can you wait two days and we'll get them all out for you. We'll actually have uh, access to them. So it's going to take a while. We're still in transition. Our goal is also to place a lot of the collections online. Uh, thanks to the work of Jackie Bell and William Andrews and others, all of the artifacts in the period rooms have already been photographed. And thanks to Ned Robertson, we have a special uh, Past Perfect software module, so we'll be posting those online. Uh, perhaps I'll be uh, retired by that time. It's, it's hard, hard to say. But I do, I do uh, want to end just again by thanking you all for coming. We, we ended up with a beautiful... Uh, day for it, uh, and do want to mention to you, in case those of you uh, who are interested in rocking on the porch, that's not really a full porch. It looks like it from a distance. We're very fortunate. We were able to reproduce the 1880s porch and also include the wheelchair ramp inside. So if you rock, you've got about two and a half feet of porch. <laughs> Please go easy. Uh, but uh, it's worked out quite well, and uh, so we, we invite you now to join us over at uh, the new side steps where we will have the ribbon-cutting ceremony and officially dedicate the Mary E. Valentine Collections Wing. Thank you. And do come inside afterwards. The refreshments, and you can tour the house. All right, yeah. let's... Venture over. I have the scissors. I have these tiny the scissors. Come on. Valentine. Mary Emma Valentine.